Hello everyone, welcome to Democracy Dialogues, where we go beyond the headlines to discuss what's really happening in the Americas. I'm your host, Eric Farnsworth, coming to you once again from Washington, D.C. The world is witnessing the 18th consecutive year of declining freedom, including right here in the Western Hemisphere, according to the latest annual assessment from Freedom House. With half the global population poised to vote by the end of 2024, this year is pivotal for democracy. Today, we're honored to welcome Michael Abramowitz, who's the president of Freedom House, He's a former director of the National Holocaust Museum, also here in Washington, and the past national editor and White House correspondent for the Washington Post. He's here to discuss the latest Freedom in the World report, which paints a stark picture from actions that chip away at democratic foundations to conflicts that trample on human dignity. Michael's expertise is invaluable in understanding the state of political rights and civil liberties around the world. Michael Abramowitz. Thanks for joining us here at Democracy Dialogues. It's a real pleasure to have you. It's great to be here. I really appreciate being invited. Freedom House is a true leader in the movement for freedom worldwide. Each year you release your report on the state of freedom worldwide. Tell us what you found this year and what some of the trends are. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, freedom House, if I could just say a word about Freedom House, we're a 83-year-old nonprofit. We've been around since 1941. We were actually founded to confront the America First movement of the late 1930s and early 1940s. So it's a, it was surprising to me when I came back to be, when I came to be the head of Freedom House that we're still confronting some version of an America <laughs> First movement. So your mission remains as relevant today our as mission it ever is, was. Our mission yeah. is very relevant today. Yeah. And, and one thing I'd like to say to your listeners is that we are an action tank as well. We, we, have, a, we have qualities of a think tank, but we also are active in 14 different countries around the world. We are supporting civil society groups, human rights defenders in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. And we are also advocates for pro-human rights, pro-democracy policy. So we, we're not just uh, uh, scratching our chins <laughs> and, and talking about what's happening in the world. We're trying to do something about it. Yeah. But Freedom in the World is our flagship report. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we uh, just a few weeks ago, released the 51st, 51st edition of the report. Uh, it comes out usually in the first month or two of every year. Mm -hmm. uh, the first report came out in 1973, and it's essentially, some people call it like the Michelin Guide for countries with respect <laughs> to democracies. We rate every country in the world, including the United States, which is an important point. Uh, we are not just pointing the finger elsewhere, we're also looking inwardly as well, and that's become more and more of an issue uh, in recent years. But we rate every country in the world for their adherence to uh, political rights and civil liberties. And essentially the, 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 the basic story that Freedom of the World tells is that really after about three or three and a half decades of steady democratization since 1973, punctuated by the fall of the Berlin Wall mm -hmm. in 1989, and really the fall of Latin American dictatorships and other dictatorships around the world in the 70s and 80s, democracy has hit a, a rough spot. Mm. And we're in what many have described as a democracy recession, which in Freedom House terms means that every year for the past 18 years, more countries have experienced more declines in, in political rights and civil liberties than those that experienced uh, improvements. Mm. So last year, 2023, which was the key finding of our last report, uh, 50 two countries experienced declines and only 31 advanced with respect to respect for political rights and civil liberties. That's a wide gap. We thought the gap might be narrowing, but actually we are in uh, an intensification of a democracy recession. And do you find that true in the Western Hemisphere as well? That's a global it's scenario. A, it's, but it's totally a global mm -hmm. phenomenon. Yep. It's happening in every continent uh, in the world, um, uh, every country, and we can talk about the, the global trends, but. Latin America is not immune uh, to those trends. Now, it's interesting, uh, I was just in Latin America, and so this is top of mind, but the, uh, our report identifies the, the Americas and Europe as probably the two places in the world that have the strongest attachment mm -hmm. to democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't forget that. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you know, compared to the rest of the world, Africa, uh, Asia, uh, the Eurasia region, uh, Latin America is still 
fares pretty well, but there's no doubt there's been a deterioration mm. of respect for rights uh, in the continent. Uh, Ten years ago, you know, Cuba was kind of the outlier yeah. in, yeah. In, in, in Latin America. Now you have countries like Venezuela, mm -hmm. Nicaragua, which are sliding towards uh, really authoritarian rule. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about that just a little bit. You recently visited with Guatemalan President Arevalo. He was, in fact, a, host, uh, a visitor here at uh, Democracy Dialogues, and uh, he's got a, a really interesting mandate as the new president of Guatemala. What did you find? Are you relatively hopeful after your meeting uh, with him? Guatemala is a very interesting story. As you suggest, we have a lot of negative news to report in general, yeah. not just in Latin America, but around the world. And to us, Guatemala is something of a, what you might call a bright spot. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly a country that has been through a lot. Uh, I think there's been some deterioration over the years in Guatemala's scores, but President Arevalo really came from nowhere. Yeah. And he was really buoyed by a, uh, by a mandate, a really strong feeling from the people of fighting the entrenched corruption in Guatemala, adhering to the rule of law, paying attention more to the indigenous people of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he really kind of came out of nowhere and there was a strong effort to really block him both from staying on the ballot and then taking office, as yeah. you know. They yeah. kind of the vested interests kind of use legalistic means mm -hmm. to try to block him. But the United States, the EU, other countries in the region really were strongly behind him yeah. taking office. And so what I would say is that we came away with some hope. We mm -hmm. met him. He's a very impressive man. He has a lot of uh, charisma and he just exudes decency. Uh, that said, he has a lot of work ahead. But, but I think the reason why I think I, I flag it from a democracy point of view is that you gotta not always get gloomy about mm -hmm. things. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, as in Guatemala, the people are demanding change. Yep. And we see that around the world. Yep. And so, I, I w we'd like to think that Guatemala could be a good news story mm -hmm. five years from now if President Arevalo is a success. Well, and the point that you're making that the United States, working with the Europeans, working with some of Guatemala's neighbors, the international community really did come together to support the electoral process. And uh, yes, he's got a long way to go, but it is relatively encouraging. I would certainly uh, concur with those comments. Absolutely. And I think yeah. what, what I came away with there is that I thought, you know, there's a lot of skepticism in some quarters about. U.S. involvement overseas. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a certain isolationist wing. But what I th really think was good in the U.S. is not from a partisan point of view, but they were standing up for the integrity yes. of the electoral process. Yes. That elections are something that mm -hmm. people in right, left, and middle should be able to agree on. And so to us, it was enormously impressive that the United States really, with all the other things that are going mm -hmm. on in the world, and not just the United States, by the way, yep. also other countries in the region, and also the Guatemalan people, had to demand it for themselves, mm -hmm. that they really stood up for really one of the basic principles of democracy. You mentioned that the Freedom in the World report has shown a general decline over the years. Uh, worldwide and also in Latin America, Guatemala perhaps the exception that we've been talking about, but what explains that? Are, are there some drivers uh, of deterioration of freedom and democracy, something specific? Is it, I mean, social media hasn't been with us for that long, I suppose that's part of the discussion, but is there something else in the atmosphere that is causing this to happen, or is each country unique and different and you really can't generalize some of these uh, comments? Well, I think it's hard to generalize. Yeah. I think. Every country has a unique thing, but I think there's some broader trends, mm -hmm. and I think it's, uh, you know, with each country, it's slightly different. Uh, but I would say three or four things that I think about when I think about the broader, you mentioned social media. I, I, I'm a former journalist, uh -huh. and I think the kind of deterioration of independent media, the loss of accountability, uh, that function mm -hmm. for the media, uh, the ability of bad actors or, or, or nefarious overseas influences to try to tamper through mm -hmm. with the with the with social media by injecting disinformation into the bloodstream of the information that really has a big impact mm -hmm. one number that really sticks into my head from freedom in the world is that when this democracy recession started uh, in 2005 or 2006 only 14 countries scored the lowest you could score in terms of media freedom, 14. 
Now it's up to 33. Oh, wow. So it's a I, th I think the so media- It's, it's more than doubled. It's more than oh, doubled. Well. So I think, I think yeah. the media is a big factor. Yeah. I think uh, a second factor, and I think you see some element of this in, the, in, the, in Latin America as well, is that I think Russia and China, mm -hmm. for different reasons and in different ways, are more active yeah. in trying to undermine democratic norms and democratic principles. We saw that in our own election in 2016, but you know, Russia is working all over the world yep. To, yep. Uh, to undermine democratic norms. I think that's a factor. And I think you also can't discount kind of economic factors. Since mm -hmm. the 2008, 2009, you know, global economic shock, mm -hmm. I think that created a lot of tr trouble for democratic governments. They've been struggling to deliver, if yeah. you will, for their yeah. people. That was something that I think we saw in Guatemala, that there was a great expectation that President Revelo deliver mm -hmm. uh, actual concrete economic mm -hmm. improvements. And I think really the success of democracy in that region, to me, is going to be dependent on whether you can deliver. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting to hear these comments because they're very consistent with several other guests we've had uh, at Democracy Dialogues in the past. Moises Naim, who has mm -hmm. been really thoughtful on these types of discussions. Uh, we've had uh, folks from the Washington Post, your old uh, organ uh, where you used to work as well, who have had these conversations with us. And the idea that the media landscape has changed fundamentally, we're never going back to the way it was. The question I would have is for democracy defenders, for freedom advocates worldwide, how do we combat that, or how do we uh, support and strengthen democratic institutions so that outsiders like a Russia, like a China, like an Iran, or inside the Western Hemisphere, Cuba or Venezuela, how do we somehow uh, cauterize the bleeding or change the dynamics so that the impact isn't as great? Or are we just destined to live with this and we just have to do the best we can? And, and, and hope for the best. Do you have any, th I, I know it's a very, it's an emerging field here, so nobody has the answers, but you know, you're a deep student of the topic. I just wonder if you have some thoughts for us. I certainly have some thoughts about it, but I think the first thing I would say is there's no silver bullet, yeah. right? The, yeah. I, I think- Regrettably. Regrettably, <laughs> I, I wish I could, and, and I think sometimes the conversations get, get go awry because people say, well, if you do this, yeah. then democracy will turn around. I think it's a multi, it's a it's a, it's a, a multi generational and a multi factor analysis. I certainly think that shoring up the media ecosystem is important. Mm -hmm. Again, there's no silver bullet there, but you know, strengthening uh, public media I think is going to be an important factor. Helping the private media find other business models to operate in I think is really important. So I think definitely focusing on the media is an important thing. I think a second thing which I would think about, and again, I'm just thinking about my trip to Guatemala, I mm -hmm. think the, the influence of corruption, mm. uh, that's a global phenomenon. Yeah. You think about Russia, yeah. even China, certain Latin America countries. Um, uh, you know, corruption is something that is really eating away at mm -hmm. the fabric of democracy, it's I endemic, think. Yeah. And so I think that really a, a focus on trying to end corruption uh, or at least limit its influence is a, is a second thing mm -hmm. uh, that I would uh, cite. I mean, the third thing from a Freedom House perspective is that in every country in the world, whether it's the United States, whether it's Russia, whether it's Guatemala, Venezuela, there is the presence of a lively civil society. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that these local citizen movements be Supported, supported, be nourished, be mm -hmm. protected. The truth is, is that change in a place like Guatemala, Venezuela, Sudan, Myanmar, is going to come from people on the yep. ground, yep. right? But they need to know that people who are committed to democracy have their backs. Yeah. And so I think really supporting global civil society, global citizen movements, I think is something that could also pay dividends in the future. Well, I think you know your point is really well made because at the end of the day, the United States or Europe or somebody else can't impose anything on anybody exactly. and it has to come you know, from the country itself. We're facing that right now in terms of the electoral process uh, in Venezuela, yes. the date that's been called for late July, but the leading candidate who's won the uh, primaries overwhelmingly in a free and fair primary election has been disqualified by the regime. How do you combat that? It's the same thing that the Nicaraguans have done. It's the same thing that others are doing worldwide. Putin just did it in the elections that he ran. I mean, how do you support civil society when, and it is a, again, it's a tough question, but, but when the regime in power is bound and determined not to have a credible candidate to run against in any sort of electoral uh, 
uh, process? I mean, are there things well, that can be done? Well, let me just start. I think Venezuela is really one of the most important stories right now I agree. in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And the reality is if Maduro is able to stay in power with a farcical election, uh, it's really to be bad news for that country. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not just from a democracy point of view, but just he's shown no ability to kind of manage the economy right. in a way that really benefits all the citizens. So mm -hmm. we are really watching Venezuela very carefully. And that's a complicated one because, you know, he did commit to having an election a few months ago or at mm -hmm. some point yep. last mm -hmm. year. And the United States, the OAS, the other countries in the region, it's important that they hold him to that commitment, yes. right? Yes. He should be obligated to have a free mm -hmm. election in that country mm -hmm. and allow anyone who wants to run against him to, uh, to run and not to be disqualified in legalistic terms. It's clear that Mrs. Machado, she's a very popular candidate. Absolutely. And if she had a clear, clear opportunity to run, she would have a good chance of winning. She must be allowed to run. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important fact. I think the other thing I would say is, looking forward, we're going to have to be very clever as a world community about how we nourish and support these uh, uh, citizen movements. You know, honestly, in places like China, in places like Russia, in places like Myanmar today, Nicaragua, Cuba, it's very hard to have a vibrant civil society. It's almost impossible. It's, it's almost yeah. impossible. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we're seeing at Freedom House yeah. is more activists and journalists sadly leaving their countries mm -hmm. of origin and going to other yep. countries, setting up shop, trying to cover uh, the country, advocate from, from outside. Now, I, I think that's in the long term not as effective as being on the ground. Right. But honestly, anyone who raises their hand to complain about the situation in Russia goes into jail. Mm -hmm. So it's a really complicated thing. We have to think a little bit more creatively about how we support mm -hmm. global so civil society in exile. And one of the things that folks like you know, many observers in Washington or elsewhere often don't appreciate is the personal cost it takes to stand for democracy and freedom in an oppressive society or, or against a regime that's determined to uh, root out any sort of opposition or to uh, undermine civil society. I, th I think you're exactly right, and, but it's costly and it, co well, you know, it affects per individuals and, and families. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah. one of the great privileges I have as the president of Freedom Mass is to meet some of these really brave and I call them freedom defenders, freedom yeah. fighters, yeah. human rights activists. As you go around the world, I think <laughs> it was just visiting Washington today was Felix Miradiaga, yep. who Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. just about a year ago was released after two or three years uh, in totally trumped up charges. Mm -hmm. He had the temerity run to say, I'm going to run for president <laughs> against Mr. Ortega. And so, well, that's an easy way to assure election right, throw all seven of, yeah, your, yeah, of, your, of your opponents uh, <laughs> into jail. So, but Felix is just one of the most remarkable people that I've met. Uh, he's now on the board of Freedom House. We're really happy and proud to have him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, really suffered deeply and his family suffered deeply. Yeah from that time in, but he's come out of prison. He wants to fight. Mm -hmm. He wants to do what he can to support other mm -hmm. political prisoners. And so I, I totally agree with you. These people are deeply inspiring. Yeah, yeah, they really are. And he's a perfect example. And there are many others coming out of Nicaragua too, but uh, it's, a, it's a tragic circumstance. You mentioned the United States. The United States is part of your uh, review uh, for the index that you publish each year. Let me ask you a question about the power of example. Uh, the United States is going into our own electoral process. We're already well in it. Uh, the question I would have is how important as it is, this is what you might call a leading question, but how important is it that the United States uh, has a free and open and transparent uh, electoral process that uh, we can use as an example when we're ask asking other countries to follow certain norms and, uh, and procedures? Well, I completely agree with the, with the premise of your yeah. question that mm -hmm. it's absolutely vital that the United States play an important role globally. And we do that, obviously, by helping support democracy overseas. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. really, the most important thing we can do is to be a strong democracy. Yeah. I yeah. think that's really the most important thing that we can do. You know, this has always been the uh, point of view of Freedom House. In fact, it's in our founding charter. Uh, about, this is in language in 1941, but, but how the founders of Freedom House, which included a diverse group of individuals, really wanted the United States to be a beacon to the world in terms of democratic practice. Yeah. And so obviously, I think you have to approach that with humility. You look at our history, 
uh, slavery, Jim Crow, other blights on U.S. democracy are real. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that is very inspiring to me, as I understand U.S. democracy, U.S. history, is that there's a constant effort to, to improve ourselves. So even as when things look bad, there's still an effort to mm -hmm. try to live up to the ideals of our, of our founding documents, which still are very powerful. I think it's crucial the United States have a successful election this year and that the winner is seen as having been fairly elected and that people accept the results no matter which. If that doesn't happen, that's going to be very damaging for the United States. Yeah, yeah, not just for ourselves domestically, but our, the power of our voice exactly. uh, overseas. Exactly. It, it, will, it will really get in the way. Yeah. Absolutely. As we begin to head toward the end of our session together, uh, we've already covered a lot of ground, but let's come back to Latin America then and the Western Hemisphere, which includes the Caribbean as well. Uh, we do have some positive examples we've talked about. We have some negative examples we've talked about. But the question I would have is the region is going through yet again an electoral season, uh, as many other countries in the world are. Uh, what's the message that you might want delivered to the people of the region in terms of the linkage between freedom and democracy uh, or the, the, the rule of law? I mean, what is it that is a message that resonates uh, that uh, the United States can promote effectively and that can meaningfully contribute to the strengthening of democratic institutions in the region? Look, I think the core message is very simple, yeah. which is that the consent of the governed is critical to a success of a government. If you know, if there's an election and a and there's a winner and it's fairly arrived at, that should give a lot of uh, assurance to people mm -hmm. that that things will be ultimately in good shape because mm -hmm. they know that if the person they have elected president does not succeed, uh, they have an opportunity to replace that person in four or five years. You know, one of the key findings of our Freedom of the World Report this year, which I want to come back to briefly, was that electoral manipulation yeah. is on the rise. Yeah. And what you see is incumbents really trying to manipulate uh, the systems, the rules to, to stay in power. Now, clearly, the, the best example of that was in Nicaragua, their election two or three years ago, where the president dispensed of, of elections by <laughs> imprisoning his seven opponents. But you can do it in more subtle ways. Mm -hmm. You can do it by uh, denying, uh, by, by trying to rule potentially powerful candidates off the ballot mm -hmm. with spurious legal yep. charges. You can even try to do it after the election. That's what happened in Guatemala, yep. where uh, there was an effort uh, really to uh, say, hey, this election wasn't fairly decided and throw out the results mm -hmm. and, and, and do it and have a do-over essentially. And, and that thankfully was blocked. Mm -hmm. So I think electoral manipulation is on the rise in Latin America and all over the world and we have to recognize it and really de rededicate ourselves mm -hmm. to the integrity of elections. One of the things we've noticed is that uh, autocrats learn from each other. You know, they share best practices or worst practices yes. depending on your point of view. But, the, the, you know, if they get away with it in Managua, why wouldn't they try the same thing in Caracas? If they get away with it in Caracas, why not somewhere else? And the point that I'm making is, even when it happens on the ground, if there's no cost to doing that, if there's no sanction to doing that from the international community, then it just makes it more attractive for others to copycat, no? Absolutely, yeah. and that's why it's also important for democracies like the United States or in Europe not to adopt laws yep. that might seem mm -hmm. like they're necessary, but they're actually could be copied mm -hmm. by other autocrats mm -hmm. yeah. to you know, like this whole issue about foreign agents is mm -hmm. something that's interesting. You know, Putin kind of pioneered that in, uh, in Russia, where he basically uh, kind of defanged, undercut civil society by going after them legally and saying they were foreign agents. And now other autocrats have, have copied that, going yep. to your point. Yep. So I think it's really important to... Uh, you know, try to be very surgical in trying to mm -hmm. address some of the challenges facing democracy. I want to ask you a final question about a topic that often isn't thought about in the context of freedom and democratic governance, and it's the issue of crime and criminal activity. Latin America, regrettably, is awash in certain activities, organized crime, 
petty crime, personal uh, security is a real issue in many countries, too many countries across the region. How does Freedom House look at crime and, and these sorts of activities in terms of how it affects personal freedom, and does that factor into your rankings, your report? Are you thinking about it from a democratic process, or do you see it as a sort of a more isolated issue? No, no, no. I think, I think the issue that you raise is, is absolutely critical. Corruption and crime yeah. are real, you know, in kind of criminal networks, mm -hmm. drug cartels. They are actively undermining democracy yeah. uh, in many countries, and we're very much attuned to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a good point. I mean, you see that actually, again, using this example, because it's fresh in my mind from my trip, but in Guatemala, uh, you know, the idea that criminal networks you know, have influence on the judiciary system, on the prosecutor's office, so that it really interferes with the rule of law. Rule of law is an absolutely critical part mm -hmm. of, of democracy, as your members can, can appreciate. <laughs> if you cannot have your investment safe in a particular yeah. country, uh, and the, the, in the, in the legal system uh, it's kind of a crapshoot, mm -hmm. or it's controlled by people who are asking for a payoff mm -hmm. in response to a favorable decision, then you don't really have a, it, it, it tarnishes democracy. Mm -hmm. And so we're very much attuned to that issue. I have uh, a confession, which is to say that every time a foreign leader comes to this room and asks the private sector for greater investment in his or her country, invariably one of the first responses is, you have a wonderful country, how's your rule of law? And I think the investors look at that, not just you know, from a perspective of investments, but frankly, traveling and, and the safety of executives and folks like that. So I think it's absolutely critical. It's fundamental right. in and terms I, of and development. And I would say you could look at it also maybe in a more positive way, mm -hmm. because I do think corruption is one of the Achilles heels mm -hmm. for this uh, autocratic regimes. Mm -hmm. You think about Alexei Navalny. Mm -hmm. He's on our mind now because he was essentially murdered by the yep. by the Russians in a penal colony. But you know, one of his great successes came from being able to spotlight the corruption of the Putin regime, yep. and uh, and really using YouTube and other vehicles, a positive use mm -hmm. of social media, mm -hmm. to really put the spotlight on the kind of corrupt nature of the Putin regime. And you see that all over the world, those opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think we need to look at these corrupt practices as a potential lever to help bring down authoritarian mm -hmm. regimes. Well, on that relatively hopeful note, uh, there is an Achilles heel that we can work on together to try to uh, dismantle, or, or a better word is to, uh, uh, to disempower uh, some of the authoritarian regimes and their effectiveness abroad. What a fascinating conversation. I wish we had more time to pursue some of these topics. I hope you'll come back to Democracy Absolutely. Dialogues. Uh, and, uh, and, and perhaps next year when the, uh, the next edition of the report is issued. And hopefully you'll have some additional positive news to, to tell us. I hope we have better news next year. Indeed. Ha thanks for having me. Really appreciate thanks it. Thanks for coming by. And to all of you, our viewers, for tuning in to join us here once again at Democracy Dialogues. Join us on the first Thursday of every month at our website, as-coa.org. We're also on YouTube and Spotify. And until then, let's work together to ensure that democracy delivers for all of us.